Well, amen. Good morning, church. How are you? Happy New Year. I hope you missed me last week. Garrett did an incredible job. And uh, this morning, we have an opportunity to continue through our I Am, actually conclude the I Am series. I want you to just pause for just a moment, and I want you to contemplate how incredibly beautiful and magnificent it is that we get to gather together. We get to sing the praise of his name and declare his truth, and now we get to open God's word. So turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to John chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that and make it your own as a gift from us. <clears throat> Before we get started, I wanna thank you as a church for your incredible generosity, okay? Uh, w- your continuous, faithful giving to our church is Magnificent. In fact, we had an amazing December, and you just need to know and understand that when you are generous, you allow us to continue as a church to go where God is calling us, allows us to meet needs here at home in Bernie and around the world, and as we meet people's needs, we get to share the glorious truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that's what it's all about, lifting high the name of Jesus, okay? Now, as we continue and finish our uh, sermon series on the I Am, this morning we're gonna have uh, Jesus saying that he is the vine, that he is the one that we must attach to, and as we attach to, we bear great, incredible fruit. Imagine with me in your mind one of those award shows Okay, the annual award shows, uh, you pick out your favorite, maybe if it's sports, it's the ESPYs, maybe it's the Oscars or the Emmys. Now, I I don't say this in a pretentious way, not one of those pretentious award shows, but a good award show, one that you look forward to. You know how in those, they have those, they do the annual awards, but then periodically, they, they always seem to do a lifetime achievement award. Now imagine the Apostle Paul is being honored for lifetime achievement. As they talk about all that he did for the gospel and for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, okay? When you think about the, 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 the number of converts and the, the churches that he planted and even writing scripture, and so they give, they give this long, lengthy introduction to Paul about his lifetime achievement, and he goes up there, and you could imagine with me that he might say something just like this. Yet not I, but Christ who is in me. Now, as odd as that would seem to the world, that would just seem so bizarre. For those of us who have been taught to to think and to understand in biblical categories, we hear that, we say, amen. Amen, that's right. It was Jesus working in you. As we get to this final I am statement, Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Attach to me, and you will realize that Christ through us produces incredible, magnificent fruit. That's the sermon in a sentence. And think with me this morning. Also, I want you to prepare your mind and your heart the entire time that we get to take the Lord's Supper together. So now listen as I read. John chapter 15, I'm gonna read the first eight verses. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and will gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 
My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we read and heed and meditate upon your word this morning, Father, would you teach us this glorious truth that we have the ability to abide in you? and to bear much fruit. Father, we invite you this morning to examine us. We invite you to prune us, as difficult as that is for us to say, we invite you because we trust you and we need you to examine us and and to trim off the dead so that we will We will be attached to you so that we will love you. Father, our hearts are prone to love the things of this world. We ask you to to pierce our hearts so that as we take the Lord's Supper, we would not do it in an unworthy manner, but rather, Father, we would do it abiding in you in a way that glorifies you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. We start with the incredible point that Garrett left us with last week. That is that the context here in John chapter 15 is stunning. Jesus is about to experience the worst 12 hours in the history of the world. He knows it's coming, and yet he will spend so much time comforting his disciples. They don't even have categories for what's about to occur. They can't even comprehend it. It's gonna be coming at them so fast. They're gonna be frightened and overwhelmed. And so Jesus, in a moment of comfort, it's like he grabs them and he says, listen, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, it's going to be that same sort of teaching and comfort that is a thread that runs through our passage. Jesus senses that it's time to leave the upper room, that they will make their way through Jerusalem, ultimately to the Mount of Olives, over the Kidron Valley, to the Mount of Olives, where they will spend hours praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. It is in the middle of the night in Jerusalem The city has finally gone to sleep after the blistering activity of the Passover celebration. The stars shine bright in the cool night air as they walk past the temple. In moments, they will cross over the bridge and look down at the Kidron Valley and see the, the, the blood running through the valley because there's been more than 10,000 slaughtered lambs for the Passover. But just prior to that, Jesus and his disciples are passing by the temple. And to their right, they can see an enlarged golden grapevine that is draped across the temple doorway. Standing over 100 feet high, a richly carved vine of finest gold and costly jewels adorned the round gate. First placed there by Herod, the grapevine was in many ways a national emblem. Kind of like the stars and stripes to us. Now, many Old Old Testament passages, particularly uh, Psalm 80 and Isaiah 5, referred to Israel, pictured Israel as God's vine or vineyard. Seeing that vine, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, I am the true vine. And you are branches And you must abide in me as a branch must abide in a vine. For apart from me, you can do nothing. But in me, you will produce much fruit. You see, the metaphor is simple. Even to those of us that don't know a whole lot about uh, grapevines or vineyards. A branch must abide in the vine for life. 
But the theology, when you actually go back and you study this, you realize the theology is rich. It ties all the way back to previous conversations that Jesus had in the upper room to his disciples. It's worthy of intense study and meditation, far more than what I can do this morning. This morning, I can only make a few quick points. First, finally, in Christ, we are able to produce real, lasting fruit. See, although Israel was referred to Uh, As God's vineyard, there was this repeated refrain that is woven all through many uh, Old Testament narratives. Take, for example, Isaiah 5. God is the vine dresser, and he has done everything imaginable for his vineyard. He found the most fertile soil. He dug around it and removed all of the rocks. He planted the choicest vine. He hewn out a wine vat. He built a lookout tower. He did everything imaginable for his vineyard, but it only produced worthless fruit. Time and time again, the refrain is, God has done everything for Israel, but all they have produced is bitter, worthless fruit. Psalm 80 says a similar refrain, except in its scene, the plea is back to God saying, God, can you, will you, will you ever restore your vineyard? But lest you and I become self-righteous this morning, it is good for us to remember that without Christ in our lives, we mirror Israel. Heck, Jesus even says it right here in this passage, No one has any ability to produce good fruit on your own. You see, without recognizing that we are mere branches, guys, we are entirely dependent on the true vine of Jesus. Without recognizing that, we will be just like Israel. Not producing good fruit, but rather producing bitter fruit. And here's the crazy thing. It doesn't matter how much religious activity that you work yourself up with. Because Israel was filled with festivals and zealots and Pharisees, only to have the Son of God show up and give pierce warnings that say, listen to me, you may look pious, you may do all the right things on the outside, but you do them with wrong motives. In fact, you are whitewashed tombs. Jesus presses us. You know, many people are all about pious activity simply so that others can see them and think, oh, they must be holy. But it's counterfeit because when you bite into it, it's a bitter fruit. Jesus gives examples of his own day. He says there are men praying on the street corner, praying big religion, using religious words and many, many words, giving in a showy way just so that other people know that they've given. (laughs) When they fast, they don't wash their face. Instead, they walk around all gloomy so that others will know that they are fasting. Jesus gives them a warning, and a warning to us. You are getting all the reward that you will get. There's no real fruit. In fact, it's bitter, because in your heart, you don't actually care about what God wants. Rather, you only care about looking good for other people to see it, and you're getting your reward. Now, doesn't that scare you? It does me, knowing that we can do all the right things on the outside, but with the wrong motives and bear no real fruit. Jesus actually presses further. He says, when you hate your neighbor, you can't love God. Now check out this picture. Now how's this for a silly feud between two neighbors? Now imagine this guy on the right Showing up for church that week, showing up and singing his heart out for Jesus. Jesus says, nope. 
You can't do that. That's bad fruit. You have to go fix that first. You say, well, well, I've never done that. But we gossip, speak harsh, careless words. Have you bypassed others in need? Not offered forgiveness? Do you harbor bitterness over a relationship that needs reconciliation? See, the Bible says that at the end of our lives, we will stand before God Almighty and everything we've ever done will be tested by God's holy fire. And all of our motives, everything will be exposed. And anything that we have not done in faith and for the glory of Jesus will be burned up, turned to nothing. And 1 Corinthians chapter three says, you and I will feel a great loss because we will realize we wasted opportunities to actually bear real fruit. But the law could never produce fruit. And you and I on our own can never produce real lasting fruit. Now, here the wonderful, magnificent words of Jesus. Because finally, in him, we can produce real, lasting, genuine, stand before God on judgment day, fruit. Amen. Guys, drink that in. That through the Holy Spirit, we can abide in Jesus, that we can have a clean heart and he will through us produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And the longer that you and I abide in him, the more we look like him and walk like him. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Jacob de Caesar was captured and tortured by the Japanese during World War II during the Doolittle Raid. He endured horrible, awful, unimaginable conditions in solitary confinement, senseless beatings, and his hatred for his captors grew beyond comprehension. And then one day, years into his captivity, he was gifted a Bible. He began to read it, and he got saved. He read Jesus' commands to love your enemies. And as he learned to abide in the vine, he began to love his captors, no longer hate them. In fact, his love for the Japanese people would be so large that shortly after his release, voluntarily, he went back and would spend the duration of the rest of his life as a Christian missionary, preaching the gospel and planting more than 23 churches all through Japan. Genuine fruit of love. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Here's another example that's closer to home. Amidst this most recent COVID outbreak, a family who recently moved here to Bernie and has been attending our church, they found themselves in the middle of an emergency. Their whole crew, kids and adults, had covid when suddenly the father began to experience excruciating chest pain. With no family to turn to and desperate to get to an emergency room, one of our deacons got up in the middle of the night and would spend a few days with the children, even though exposed him to COVID and would alter their Christmas plans. 
And then the growth group followed up by hosting meals and continually praying over them. Genuine fruit of selfless love. Amen. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. We're talking about real joy that can permeate your marriage and your home. And listen to me, I'm not talking about, that, uh, about the fact that you, you uh, have to be perfect or you, or you can't make mistakes. The, the reality is at any moment, you and I are offered the ability to abide in Christ and bear genuine, lasting fruit. Real peace, even when you get the phone call that says it's cancer. Real generosity and servanthood. Fruit that's able to stand the test of God's holy fire. And then afterwards you will hear from the Lord, well done, my good and faithful servant. Friend, you will be before him very, very soon. You know, we just walked through the Christmas season and one of my favorite songs is The Little Drummer Boy. And the little drummer boy is a poor boy who's coming to see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but he has nothing to give. And so realizing his absolute limited inability to give, he gives the only thing he has and he plays his drum. But in realizing he has nothing to give, he gives and in the end, you actually realize it's everything to be able to do it for the glory of God. Think about this. Church, soon, very soon, you will stand before God Almighty. Everything will be tested by fire. But what you have done abiding in the vine will be a lasting treasure an eternal reward, and you will hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Secondly, you have to realize through this passage that pruning is a natural part of the Christian life and cannot be avoided, okay? You may or may not be aware of what pruning in horticulture is, all right? I'm a city slicker, and the, these truths avoided me for a long time. All right, but pruning is when the gardener trims back portions of here the grapevine. And as I learned this week, there are many types of pruning of a grapevine. There's pinching, which prevents the growing of a shoot from growing too rapidly. There's topping, all right, when one branch becomes so heavy that it jeopardizes the entire shoot. There's thinning, the grape uh, clusters, which enables the branch to produce much better quality of a grape. In the winter time, to protect against the colder, harsh weather, uh, there's trimming and pruning all the way back to protect the grapevine. Now here's the deal, although seemingly painful, pruning is the only way to grow a healthy, delicious grapevine. And Jesus uses this as the metaphor to describe the Christian life. Somehow we've gotten the idea that if we just abide in Jesus, we'll live this euphoric, problem-free, pain-free, just happy all the time life. I won't lose my job. I won't have any health issues. My health will be guaranteed. I'll have great relationships and that if we're not experiencing that, that the real problem is, is, well, you're just not abiding in Jesus enough. Beloved, listen to me. That's garbage. Because Jesus tells you right here, right here in this passage, that the Father has the ability to look at you and seize your life, and your life is in need of pruning. It's in need of pinching and thinning and cutting off. And it will hurt. Real hurt. Genuine pain. But it will produce glorious fruit. 
Beloved, could you imagine with me what would happen if you were able to avoid all your trials? What would become of you? Let me introduce you to Shrek, the Marino sheep from New Zealand. Now, once a year, Marino sheep have their coats sheared. But Shrek hated nothing more than having his coat removed. So one year, during shearing season, he escaped. And apparently, he was able to hide out in local caves, surviving on his own for six years. This is what he looked like when he came back. (laughs) Beloved, this is what you would look like if you were able to avoid all the trials in your life. But hear me, Jesus loves you too much. The Father loves you too much to not prune you. The good news is you never have to worry about this because the Father will prune those whom are his. He will take care of you. Listen, I tell you this because so often when trials come, we think we've done something wrong. We think we've done something wrong. But the reality is, is Jesus is not punishing you. He's pruning you. When I saw this next video a couple months ago, I couldn't wait to show it to you. Because you will see a man named Gary Godfrey, who, as you'll see in the video, uh, was healthy, was vibrant, but he got ALS. And this is his baptism video um, that you're about to watch. It was showed just before his baptism. Go ahead and watch this. Gary Godfrey, I was very active in our church as a youth. I started to drift away from the church when I was in college and the start of my career. While I was able to find success, my relationships with the people I loved the most began to suffer. On the outside, I looked like a successful person. My heart felt empty, and I was not the person I wanted to be. Little did I know I would need Jesus to face the biggest challenge of my life. In January 2019, I received devastating news that I was diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. In less than two years, I went from being very active to losing my ability to walk or run, use my arms and hands, speak or breathe without assistance. A challenge too big to face on my own, I needed Jesus in my life. Once I placed my faith in Jesus and gave him my life, I felt a calmness that I have never felt before. I knew Jesus was with me for every challenge I would face going forward. He promised to never leave me, and he already took every one of my burdens when he died on the cross. (laughs) Each day is a blessing that I don't take for granted. One of my favorite Bible verses is from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 and 34. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all that you need will be provided to you. So, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. I know God has a purpose for me. I believe Jesus wants me to share about being intentional about each day and trying to have a special impact on someone and making today their best day. Today's baptism is truly my best day. I am Gary Godfrey, and my faith in Jesus changed everything. Here's the picture of Gary being baptized. Pause for a second and think about what he said. That when he had health, when he had life, when he had everything according to this world, he was empty inside. And he came to saving faith in Jesus Christ and he didn't know at the moment but he was about to get ALS. And his entire world was about to be rocked from its foundation. 
But what you heard in his testimony was real, genuine fruit. Fruit that declares Jesus Christ is so much better than anything this world could ever offer you. Isn't that incredible? So beloved, as we move towards the Lord's Supper, if you did not get elements as you came in, if you would lift your hand and we'll have uh, deacons who will come around and uh, give you those and you can go ahead and prepare your Lord's Supper. But listen to me as we move towards that. Jesus is compelling us to abide in him. This final I am statement is a call for us to choose to abide. Jesus is the vine. That is, he is the only source of life. That there, outside of him, there is no life. Just like he is the bread, just like he is the light of the world, here, Jesus is the vine. But in this final I am statement, he presses you, he compels you, he calls you to himself. This is, this is actually the, the Christian life lived out. That is that you and I can abide in him, can stay connected to him, can bear genuine, lasting fruit. The scripture warns us to never take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, but rather that we should be examining ourselves or welcome the Holy Spirit to examine us and to convict us. Friend, the Lord's Supper is for born again believers. There's nothing magical about the, the bread or the juice, but to those of us that know him, you see, it's a picture of his broken body and his shed blood. This is a moment for us to, to enter back and to kneel at the foot of the cross. So beloved, where has the Father been pruning you? And where have you been resistant? Where has your priorities been mixed up? And right here in this brief moment, you need to kneel at the foot of the cross. You need to say to your heavenly father, the vine dresser, and to the vine, I'm sorry, forgive me. I come back to you. I need to abide in you. I confess my sins. I lay them down. So I'm gonna give you a few moments to say that to King Jesus, and then we'll take this together. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Now, as you go ahead and prepare the cup, Friend, aren't you glad that Jesus in this passage said, listen, you are already clean. And woven through this passage is, is the fact that as believers, 
We are forgiven. We are his. That fact has been taken care of. It's guaranteed. And then we are called to choose that we are freed up now to abide in him. And as we do that, we are actually assured victory. That is that in Jesus Christ, we have the power and the ability, yet not I, but Christ through me, to walk out in victory. He doesn't leave us in our sin. Even though we failed a million times prior, the offer is still, come, abide in me. Walk out in freedom. So as we take this cup, I want you to remember the victory and the freedom that is yours in Christ. That you would say, yet not I, but Christ through me. taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are life. We thank you that, that even though on our own we had no ability to produce life, you came. You became man. You entered into our suffering and you died and were resurrected and you have redeemed and ransomed us so that now you say to us that you are the vine. Thank you for that life. We cling to you this morning as branches who are prone to wander. King Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you teach us more and more to abide in you? Would you teach us to move and to live for eternity, for that day? Would you burn that image in our mind, teaching us to to put our riches in what truly matters and what truly lasts. And through you, King Jesus, we are actually able to produce fruit. Help us to live for that. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.